But so much for the past. Let's bring it all down to the present. How does all this impact upon the Church right now, today? As we have seen, history repeats itself, and so spiritual history repeats itself. It's an old story. The people of God fall into sin. There are ramifications. There is judgment. It is a cycle that has been fulfilled many times in history, and perhaps too in our own age. The dynamic between the battle between the kingdom of God and the kingdom of darkness, the removing of the lampstand, the rise and fall of God's people on earth, all these involve themes that find their fulfillment both in biblical history and in history since. Perhaps the real question we should be asking is, how bad is the church in the Western world right now? And what signs could there be that the lessons of history may be repeated in our own day? For one thing, as in the examples of France, Russia and Germany in their respective times, the Church today has reached unacceptable levels of sin and doctrinal compromise. Let's have a look at the following. Literally hundreds of cases of sexual abuse of children by priests have been reported worldwide. As far as Protestants are concerned, reports of falling pastors and tele-evangelists come through on a regular basis. More recently, the news broke in early 2019 about sexual abuse in the Southern Baptist Church, some 700 victims in 20 years. Heresy is widespread in several mainstream denominations, where the Bible is no longer taken as the Word of God, while the virgin birth and the miracles of Jesus are frequently denied. Church synods in certain denominations have sometimes been known to be opened and dedicated in prayer to bizarre deities such as Mother Earth. In at least one case, feminist priests took communion in the name of Sophia, the Greek goddess of wisdom. A mass in a New York cathedral in the 1990s was held to a number of non-Christian gods in an effort to build bridges with other religions. An increasing number of churches are allowing same-sex ministers and condoning same-sex behaviour. A retired Episcopalian bishop married his gay partner in a public ceremony, even inviting his young grandson to attend. As a result, churches are emptying by the year, and some denominations find themselves in financial crisis. We saw the heinous state of theological seminaries in Russia in the decades leading up to the revolution. It would be convenient to think that we did not have a similar problem in our seminaries today. The fact is, however, that we do. There are staggering problems in many of our modern theological institutions which many don't know about and which are seldom reported from the pulpit. Seminaries in at least one major denomination have been described as a hotbed of same-sex activity. Here the former Pope Benedict said recently that following the 1966 revolution, quote, homosexual cliques were established in various seminaries which acted more or less openly and significantly changed the climate in the seminaries. Here he implicitly linked the growth of homosexuality to paedophilia and the Catholic abuse situation. Other seminaries openly espouse heresy and even terrorism. It has been said of one seminary in another major denomination that some students go in Christians and come out atheists. Why is that? Because what is taught is so dark, so godless, so devoid of life and the spirit, that the students start to give up hope, start to think, maybe there is no God. Things like this are happening right now, today, in the post-Christian West. And then these same students are one day given spiritual charge of a church. It is not surprising that in some circles the church has become a laughing stock. One can imagine similar attitudes to the church at those times in history when it reached its lowest, where satires and gossip abounded. Our churches should be collectively on their knees in repentance. Major conferences should have been called, making this priority number one. Instead, we find frequent attempts at cover-up, while others preach feel-good sermons as though nothing were wrong. As long as churches continue to ignore the problems in our midst, they can only get worse. Not surprising that one observer has stated that the church in the West has reached its lowest point in 500 years, since the decadence and corruption of the Borgia era in the 1490s. The secular world is not much better. As we all know, the West has suffered a great moral collapse since the 1960s. 
sexual depravity broke out as a result of the sex revolution and has been increasing in intensity ever since. Partying and nightclubs have spiralled into a cesspool of drunkenness, worldliness and drug abuse. In some formerly good countries, the age of sexual consent has been low to 16 years. Not surprising, levels of teen pregnancy, rape and divorce have escalated along with it. For the Western world too, levels of immorality have reached their worst in some centuries. The downward spiral continues. Immorality then led to homosexuality. Homosexuality led to the current transgender issue. As if to compound their sin, the world now gives its orphan children to homosexual couples in adoption. Not only that, but they are now allowing underage children to embrace a transgender lifestyle to begin the process of sex change. Sadly, still the church says very little. Still the pie-in-the-sky sermons and turning a blind eye continues as if absolutely nothing were wrong. On one level, it is perhaps not surprising that the world has grown so bad. The church, the moral guardian of the world, has spoken very little on these matters, has not brought her light of the world into these dark places. Tragically, it seems that the church has actually allowed the world to infect it, is becoming conformed to the world and its immorality. We saw in the three cases of France, Russia and Germany what happens when the church reaches high levels of sin and corruption and when it consequently does not speak into the problems of its day. As we have seen, the church, the lampstand, is the light of the world. If that light grows dim or does not shed its light, the lampstand will be uprooted from its place and its light put out. Now this phenomenon of the church failing to shed its light may come about in one of two ways, or possibly both. Either, one, it becomes too spiritually lax or sinful, and the light grows dim, or two, it refuses to shed its light out of intimidation or fear, or some other reason. What then of the Western Church today, which is not speaking to the growing problem of same-sex activity, the transgender threat, as well as the scandals prevalent in the Church itself? It is actually because of church silence and refusal to speak into these situations that the problems are as big as they are. Might these issues one day become so big that laws are passed outlawing anybody who speaks against homosexuality or transgender issues at all? Or else laws passed that outlaw the church wholesale? The current trajectory certainly seems to be heading in that direction. The upshot of all this is that even when the light of the world the light in the church dims and even goes out, so the kingdom of Satan increases in power and is allowed to advance into those areas once occupied by God's kingdom. As was the case in France and Russia, sin levels in the Western church today grow more and more and remain unchecked. Consequently, the church loses more and more credibility and for a growing number of people becomes a laughing stock. And when this happens, people stop taking the church seriously as a moral guide. They stop seeing the church as moral light for them and the world, and they go elsewhere to find fulfillment and meaning in life. As we saw in all three cases, they then embrace some kind of religious substitute. This may be an official religion, or it may be a virtual religion like humanism, communism, or Nazism. Thus we today find many people embracing Eastern mystic religions more and more, or perhaps just a watered-down form of Eastern spirituality. Many embrace forms of humanism and materialism. A recent Spectator article commenting on the Notre Dame fire noted this falling away from Christianity to more virtual and conscious forms of religion, identifying what some of these substitute religions are. According to the article, at the heart of the grief is this. As we approach Passover and Easter and consider how far Christendom has fallen, how few people believe, how secularized the world has become. The burning of the church feels portentous, a visual symbol of the rot, and church and Christianity is under attack from without and from within. And this progressive march to Judeo-Christian annihilation has resulted in nihilistic secularism that substitutes empty sex for love, selfishness for family, addiction for community, consumerism for peace, Loneliness for connection. For knowing so much, our generation is woefully ignorant about what matters most and has little frame within which to build a meaningful life. That's why sad substitutes 
like climate alarmism, veganism, abortion, and the rest are treated as sacraments. In a postmodern world, they are. As the church loses power in the Western world, so the world finds other things to fill the void of the God-shaped space. So how does the lampstand lose its place? This could happen in several ways. It loses its place when it reaches such a level of sin and godlessness that God leaves it altogether and it becomes a false church, something like the official state church of Nazi Germany. Alternatively, it loses its place when anti-church forces apply such pressure on it that they persecute it, declare it illegal or have it shut down. We might be able to see the start of this already. Many churches have lost so many members that they are forced to close. In some cases, almost whole denominations have embraced terrible heresies. Liberal theology, which denies many of the tenets of traditional Christianity, is rife in theological faculties of Western universities. Could the situation ever reach the same point as Nazi Germany, where liberal church leaders reworked Christian theology to fit in with the false ideologies of the day? In fact, there are several liberal theologians and church leaders today who could be utilized to alter church doctrine that would conform to the desires and dogmas of an anti-Christian government. And there are certainly more than enough lukewarm, poorly fed pew warmers to be taken in by a false church and its silver-tongued theologians. As far as the faithful churches are concerned, the first shades of persecution may already have begun. As stories of corrupt and power-hungry ministers hit the headlines, so the church loses its right to be taken seriously. Rumours arise that the church may lose its tax-exempt status. Pressure mounts on ministers to perform same-sex marriages. Christian bakeries have been sued for their refusal to make cakes for same-sex weddings. Some Christians have already been forced out of their jobs for taking a stand against the same-sex issue. It seems that our courts and lawmakers are simply interpreting the law to suit themselves and sacrificing democracy in the process. Will the same thing happen at the coming of the Antichrist? Will we also find there the case of a weak, lukewarm church whose flock has never been properly fed, and so will just glibly accept whatever false theology its false prophets and the Antichrist system pushes down its throat? If we follow the historical pattern explored in this talk, we come to the next stage. Once the wicked system of the day has pushed the church out of the way, darkness comes over the world and a period of suffering and oppression arises. This paradigm could provide an explanation of the spiritual dynamic behind the Great Tribulation. Not for the first time it means that a period of trial comes on the church, a time which will try and refine the remnant. This would also be that period foretold by Jesus, where according to Matthew 24, at that time many will turn away from the faith and will betray and hate each other and many false prophets will appear and deceive many people. Because of the increase of wickedness, the love of most will grow cold. If the historical cycles repeat themselves, then quite possibly this is one way in which so many will be deceived. A weak church allows the kingdom of darkness to rise up and become so strong that it rears up deceptive philosophies and religious ideas that lead many astray, even in the church, and so the prophesied great falling away commences. We need to pray that we will not fall into that deception. We need to say, stay spiritually awake and alert so that we are aware of the devil's theology when it presents itself. Above all, the church needs to start speaking now into the sin and deception issue in both the church and the world. Paul said that sin must be removed from the body or else it becomes like leaven which infects the whole church. The fact is, these sins are not being addressed in our churches, they are not being uprooted, which means, according to Paul, that they are spreading, they are getting worse. And as long as they get worse, the storms that buffer the church will continue to blow, and may one day become the cause of the lampstand that is the Western church being entirely uprooted and removed totally from its place. The entire edifice may come crumbling down. Perhaps the following illustration will provide a tragic microcosm of the process of the lampstand slowly, inexorably being loosened from its place. To take one such church as an example, this certain church, like many today, has spent some decades slowly but surely slipping down into doctrinal heresy and making allowances for sexual deviation. 
The church has been warned prophetically several times, but has still not listened. What is happening as a result? Slowly over time, the church is losing support, losing membership, and with it financial support. It has also been losing its substantial property. One such church in that denomination held a meeting of its leaders and elders, about 30 people altogether, to seek where the church stood in God's eyes. Almost all of them came back with negative words, negative answers to prayer. God was not pleased with where the church was. Some of those words carried warnings. Interestingly enough, some of those warnings pertained to the same image, namely that of a light, a beacon, being put out. The church then started to lose members. As they felt the financial crush, so they sold off one house that was part of the church property. Some years later, they reached another financial crisis. They decided to sell another building. Their property shrank some more. Then some years later, another crisis. Then they sold off yet another building, and then another. And all of the time, those blessings, their property, their ground, that which God had given them, many years before, were taken away. Today the Sunday school and the youth group virtually do not exist. The congregation has dwindled. At some point they are going to run out of property and buildings to sell. And then, just then, the words of the elders may be fulfilled and the light, the beacon of that church, may go out altogether. Deuteronomy chapter 28 verses 15 to 68 is full of warnings about how blessings and land will be taken away from the people who fall away from God and break the covenant. An increase in sin sees a decrease in blessings on that people. We see this occurring with churches all over the Western world today. Those churches that fall into heresy and sin are those that are losing members and closing down. Pallying up to the world doesn't bring members, it makes the churches die. The final step then is for the lampstand the church to be snuffed out and no longer shine, no longer be a light for its designated region. God gives warnings, but the church must be spiritually alert so as to perceive and interpret those warnings. If the church is sleeping in Gethsemane, it will not be able to do so. So as this mountain faces us, the church, today, we are not for the first time given a choice we can ignore the mountain, pretend as if it isn't there, and carry on with feel-good sermons. Or we can address it and deal with it head-on. The mountain that is sin, heresy, immorality, church corruption, is not going to go away, unless we, in the power of the Spirit, make it go away. If we do not do that, it may very well prove to be the mountain that destroys us. This is the spiritual pattern. It has been fulfilled several times in history. It will be so again. Yet it does not have to be so. If the church chooses to stand and fight against the darkness through repentance and speaking into the problems of its day, it will, through the power of the Spirit within, be able to turn the tide. Church of God, Church of the formerly Christian West, the choice is ours. I pray in Jesus' name that we make it wisely.